So good evening and welcome. I'm Doris Jones from the American University in Cairo's Academy of Liberal Arts. We are delighted to have you join us for the panel discussion, Framing a Familiar Past and Present, Quest for Safety and Freedom. This panel is one of several events developed in partnership with the Photographic Gallery to introduce the grand opening of the exhibit, Stories of Displacement, a tribute to Jacob Lawrence. This exhibit is made possible by a grant from the Office of the Associate Provost for Research, Creativity, and Innovation. And this panel discussion is sponsored by HUSLAB, an initiative of AUC and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We're honored to have with us a distinguished panel of speakers, and they are Helen Zukhib, a renowned Arab American artist whose paintings are also featured in the Jacob Barnes exhibition. Her art utilizes rhythms of pattern and color with a sensitivity that perhaps only one who occupies both East and West cultural exchanges can achieve. She renders visible the unbearable pain of war, diaspora and migration and with visual, visual compassion, she so profoundly carves a path to dialogue. Welcome, Helen. Our second guest is Nora Nezilski Eichner, who is the author of Integrating Modernism, the migration paintings of Aaron Douglas, Jacob Lawrence, and Romare Bidin. Her extensive scholarship offers analysis about modernism and focuses on each artist's unique style. She is currently with the New York law firm of Cleric, Garon, and Reisbaum. Welcome, Nora. And we're also very pleased to have with us Dr. Bellatru Gabriel, who is a professor of international relations at the Management Center Innsbruck, Austria. His main research areas include international security, conflicts, migration, and global social policy. I want to take a moment to extend a warm welcome to each of you. Thank you so very much for being with us today. Before we begin our discussion, I just want to provide our audience with some biographical information about Jacob Lawrence and the migration series. So Lawrence is perhaps considered one of the most widely acclaimed African-American artists of the 20th century, and one of only several whose works are included in the standard survey books on American art. He enjoyed a successful career for more than 50 years, and his paintings portray the lives and struggles of African-Americans. Lawrence's best known collection is the Migration Series, which he produced in 1940 and 1941. This collection of 60 panels portray the migration of over a million African-Americans who fled the Jim Crow American South for industrial cities in the North between 1910 and 1940. They were seeking what the author Isabella Wilkerson refers to as the warmth of other suns. Lawrence's panels are also linked together by descriptive phrases, color, and design. Helen, let's begin the discussion with you. How did Jacob Lawrence inspire you to create the Syrian Migration Series? Well, thank you so much. I will, I will begin by thanking you Dr. Doris <laughs> and my esteemed panelists, um, I'm so proud to be uh, represented here with you. And um, Dina Aldib, the curator, co curator um, with the exhibition. I cannot even begin to tell you, exclamation points and hearts, as X's and O's, how excited and proud I am to be showing my work alongside with, I will say, probably one of my greatest heroes ever. And I know Doris, we talked about meeting him at some point and hopefully you'll indulge me with at that moment. Um, you gave a great introduction and thank you audience um, who's watching us. Thank you so much. Um, 
I, uh, you introduced Jacob Lawrence, um, uh, his background there with specifically the migration series. And as an Arab American, and as somebody who fled the civil war in Lebanon and didn't return to the region, to Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan until 35 years later, which culminated with, uh, with almost a few months later, the Arab Spring uprisings, revolutions, how you want to call them, uh, began. So as a visual artist and having just been there, and also, as you said, this, um, this feeling of empathy and identification from my own background, uh, I, I felt compelled to begin visually documenting what I was um, seeing on the news, hearing on the radio, and so on. And as my work progressed, now we are in 11 years, we mark almost to the day, uh, the 10th uh, marking, I'm not saying anniversary, uh, we, we need to acknowledge the fact that this is 10 years now of the Arab Spring. And this month specifically, even within the day, is when the revolutions in Syria turned to a bloody war, uh, which was uh, sparked by uh, graffiti on the walls uh, of, of young children who were then arrested and tortured and their families in the village of Dara began uh, began protesting, which then now we are in the 11th year of the war. That war has not ended and it doesn't seem sadly ended in sight, ending in sight. So in about 2015, I had an artist residency and as, as any good artist, you, you take into consideration your surroundings. I was taking public transportation back and forth to the, to the residency and the studio I had there. Um, and so my, my, my uh, drawing needed to be fairly small. And you know, Jacob Lawrence's pieces are 12 by 18 inches. I don't know the, the size in centimeters, but a, a fairly, not a large, a, a canvas there. So I echoed that in my size as well. And I, I began working on my series in 2015. They're still till now. I think we have about 46 of them. Um, and why I began on, on working on them, and, and do let me know when you want me to share my screen. Yes. Um, you, would you like me to? Okay. Yes, why not? I think this is a perfect opportunity for you to do so. Okay, um, and hopefully you will be able to see them. Can you see all, can everyone see that? Uh, it's still opening, there we are. Now it's open. Okay. Yes. Good, okay. Um, so this is, this, this uh, is a painting and what um, Doris suggested I do is compare Jacob Lawrence's to my work. So you see on the right of the screen is Jacob Lawrence's incredible piece. He is reflecting the riots in St. Louis, um, uh, the racial riots um, that were so prevalent. Well, I was looking and studying his work even more profoundly during this time in my, in my uh, residency. And I began seeing these parallels, almost direct, granted, as you said, um, Doris, he was painting these in 1940 and 41 and depicting a time of the migration of African-Americans from the South to the urban North in hopes of a better life. And, you know, that's what we do, right? That's what we do. Uh, they were fleeing a war of a kind, the Jim Crow laws, segregation, lynching, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in my series, the Syrian migration, of course they are fle fleeing the uprisings. And um, so here you can see elements that I have, I have uh, compared, I'll move through these. Um, Jacob Lawrence's, this is his piece. Here he refers to the drought and the abandoning of the crops as they move to the north. And you see my interpretation, the drought was another reason for the mass migration uh, of, of the Syrians. It was another spark in the uprisings about a million farmers because they had been suffering drought for several years 
about a million farmers moved into Damascus, which is the capital of Syria, and added fuel to the fire there. Um, and so they, um, they, 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 there was not, there were no jobs, and and it just intensified the whole experience and exacerbated everything. Um, it's something that people don't really focus on, but probably uh, the professor uh, in Austria will talk about that a little bit. You see here where I'm inspired by the movement. You see my pattern, my color. This, of course, yes. I think you you just said the magic word, Helen, color. Mm -hmm. When we compare the palettes between your paintings and those of Lawrence's, your palette is brighter. Why? Would you like to elaborate a bit more on why did you choose a palette that is far brighter, um, mm -hmm. even though your narratives are basically the same in terms of the flight of people. Why did you choose a brighter palette as opposed to a more somber color or colors uh, uh, that Lawrence used? I, I really love that question. And I was talking with a good friend of mine, an artist last night, we were talking about our work and she referred to this exact same uh, 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 issue that I bring, not issue, but my, my what I do, and, and we sort of decided in a strange way, it's almost a subversive way of handling such intensity as what is going on behind the scenes. As Jacob Lawrence had his little narratives beside the timeline of the movement of people, um, he depicted gruesome, gruesome episodes that were happening there with very simple declarative statements. He, he didn't make an emotion. And, and with that, it becomes even more powerful and allows you to enter into his story. And you can begin to empathize. The way that I use my colors is the same way. I, I, it is part of the way that I work, but it's, it's a, uh, a very conscious decision to create this beauty, this color, this movement, the detail, the civilization and dignity of these people that are fleeing their homes. Because let's just face it, they are doctors, they're engineers, they're lawyers. Uh, you know, they are they are seeking safety. And so, yeah. And so with the 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 aesthetic quality of the painting, more to answer your question, I I draw you to my paintings, I hope anyways, that's my intention. Once you are looking, then you can hear what I am saying, as opposed to a very gruesome depiction, uh, as in, you know, the photojournalist yesterday was referring to, some, some pieces are so horrible to look at, you turn away. Exactly. And if you're turning away, you're not listening, you're not able to go to the next step of the dialogue that you were referring to, Doris, to open that conversation, to see how we can move, how we can help, what we can do, you know? And I think, Helen, this is the beauty of art. Yeah. Art's capacity to communicate not only uh, the realities of horror, but the mm -hmm. beauty as well. During some of our initial conversations as we were planning this event, as I reviewed your paintings, I actually described them as representing tragic beauty. Mm. That I found tragedy as well as beauty in them, as you indicated, this is humanity. This is clearly a representation of human beings, as you said, who are seeking safety and freedom and who are having to leave their homes their lives and perhaps many loved ones behind. And I think that also may, if based on my interpretation, when I look at your paintings and again, see the dramatic difference in color compared to Lawrence's, that perhaps you are capturing that beauty, that you're capturing the lives of people who are seeking, again, I will quote the title of Isabella Wilkerson's book, The Warmth of Other Suns. Yes. Uh, exactly. And you know, I think this is a great point to bring in Nora into the conversation. Um, once again, Nora's scholarship 
has focused rather extensively on Jacob Lawrence, uh, Aaron uh, Douglas, and of course, Romare Bearden. And what attracted me to Nora's work is that she makes a critical argument about modernism and how each of these artists that she focused her, her dissertation on um, critically zeroes in on their unique styles and how modernism becomes very, very relevant in each of their representative works. Nora, I know that you have had an opportunity to spend some time talking with Helen and reviewing her work. Would you like to share some of your interpretations with respect to how you are finding modernistic representations in uh, these paintings? Sure, thank you so much, Doris. Um, you know, thank you been lovely to talk to Helen about her work and to um, to really engage with the way that she is engaging with Jacob Lawrence uh, and what I think the similarities between um, their approaches to migration and to the viewer's relationship to migration, uh, which will tie us back to your question about modernism. Um, you know, both of them are telling narratives about people who are uh, experiencing tremendous uh, tragedy and risk outside of their control. These are circumstances that they did not necessarily create, um, but they are also, as both of them choose to represent them, people who are agents of their own destiny. And um, Helen used the word dignity, which I think uh, is a really um, crucial one when thinking about uh, Jacob Lawrence as well. Um, yes. The idea here is not simply to show victimization, but also to show the ability, the human ability to move forward, to search, to continue to search for uh, your own best opportunities for yourself, for your children, the unwillingness to be beaten down entirely by your circumstances. Um, and this is, I think, really important uh, to connect Jacob Lawrence to the larger sort of African-American art tradition that he's part of. Um, where there was a real tension between wanting to both make visible um, the oppression that African-Americans were suffering from, to make visible and hold accountable um, those who were uh, perpetuating violence against them, and at the same time to refuse to allow themselves to be reduced to the victims of those circumstances, to assert their own agency, their own ability to create, their ability to tell their own stories, their um, commitment to continuing community and continuity in the face of that oppression. Um, and I think that that then for me ties into very important questions about what modernism as, um, <laughs> as a sort of big M category of art making um, uh, sort of was encompassing in the 20th century. So there, Jacob Lawrence is painting the migration series at a very interesting moment in American art, um, where the uh, American art world has been struggling for decades with the question of whether there is something sort of uniquely American um, to contribute in the visual arts, whether you know Americans in fact have a sort of visual culture. Um, and there has been a tremendous push uh, for the whole first half of the 20th century to sort of find that American voice. Um, and ironically, Lawrence uh, is going to get crowded out um, shortly after the migration series um, by the rise of Jackson Pollock and the abstract expressionists, which a number of curators sort of seize on as kind of the, the great American modernism. Um, but if you go back to his historical moment to the point when Jacob is paint, uh, Lawrence is painting these paintings, modernism is a much more complex entity with a lot more sort of stylistic variation. And I make an argument in my work uh, for the ways in which uh, Lawrence's modernism um, really grapples with many of the same uh, thematic issues that are going to be recognized as kind of key modernist questions, flatness in the painting, the um, refusal of naturalism without um, giving up uh, an, a commitment to sort of um, some forms of representation of um, helping to abstract shapes and forms in ways that nonetheless, um, and. Um, Helen is showing on the right one of what I find to be one of Lawrence's most powerful works from this series, the yeah. devastation that you can read um, in the simple curve of the woman's back, right? The intensity of the ways in which the Lawrence's abstraction has 
increased our emotional um, perception and engagement. And I, again, to get back to something that Helen said, um, Lawrence and, and her work both use the simplification as a way of allowing the viewer to come in and yes. to feel and to identify as opposed to being on the outside. We're not being told how this woman is feeling. We are being invited to feel in our own bodies that curve of devastation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was really moved by um, Helen's work in our sort of more, you know, postmodern art moment, shall we say, where, you know, we have now recognized a much greater pluralism of styles as still being contemporary. There's no sort of single contemporary art movement that is the dominant voice. Um, and she has then helped, I think, gone back and sort of begun to recover the ways in which Lawrence's work spoke to a very similar kind of modernist experience um, of the rural coming into the urban, the plight of the farmer coming into the big city, um, the sort of force of that political movement, the sum of a lot of individual choices that create then a mass experience and a mass movement. Um, and as Helen references, the intensity of the politics behind that the ways in which the, again, each individual choice sums up into um, a large group, each individual political decision becomes its own very powerful mass um, politics. I think um, there's a sense in which that, you know, much of the American 20th century uh, politically is driven by what happens in the migration. The arrival Absolutely. of African-Americans en masse in the urban North really changes American politics. Um, and I think that uh, I suspect we'll hear from um, my uh, political science colleague here, the ways in which the arrival of refugees um, from Syria in Europe is changing uh, exactly. European politics. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Nora, thank you so very much for that critical, um, as I refer to your work as a magnum opus, that mm -hmm. it certainly opens up wonderful perspectives. And Helen, thank you for continuing to navigate and Nora, once again, I think you opened a wonderful segue for us to allow Dr. Gebrewold to talk about some of his new scholarship that speaks very nicely to what you shared, that much of the 20th century is shaped by this exodus, this massive flight of people, primarily African-Americans, leaving the American South which impacted dramatically the economic and political systems in the South. And this image here that um, Helen is showing, this wonderful uh, comparison contrast between the movement of Syrians and African-Americans leaving for various destinations, that this movement certainly put in motion yet another aspect, which was so profoundly political and economic, which impacted not only African-Americans, but certainly in the American South for the white establishment that had grown so accustomed to the very social and economic and political systems that were greatly dependent on African-American labor. Um, mm -hmm. So with that said, Dr. Gabriel, I would like to bring you into the conversation. Um, you shared with me just recently some of your new scholarship, which speaks yet again so poignantly to the points that Nora uh, just shared. Would you like to um, provide for us a, a, to widen the scope that as we step outside of these magnificent paintings and their lasting legacy, how do you see their representations being part of a larger discussion of this absence of humanity that you and I talked about several weeks ago? Yeah, no, thank you so much. Uh, it is really fascinating to listen to you uh, and to watch these wonderful paintings. And um, both Helen and uh, Nora, you mentioned the importance of dignity and human dignity in the and the issue of migration. And that is also the, the core substance of my own research. Mm -hmm. um, I have been researching, doing this research for the past many years, I would say. And I'm interested in, in the discourse of migration or migration, as well as the motivations 
behind, um, behind migration. And, you know, be it in the United States um, regarding migrants from Latin America to Southern America to, to the United States, as well as from different parts of um, uh, Middle East or South Asia or Africa to Europe, uh, the discourse is usually um, on the economic level, on the political level, on the level of climate change. And uh, that's why I was, I have been raising this question, why, how do people understand? And what are the motivations behind um, people moving, leaving their countries? And therefore, my interest is based on three questions, I would say. Uh, first question is, how are the causes of migration usually understood, especially in the destination? In this case, for example, Europe. And the second question is, uh, what are the underlying forces of migration policies from the point of view of the destination countries? And then for me, even the, more, the most important question for my research is, what is uh, migration about beyond the root causes? So, you know, these three questions are for me the, the guiding principles. Uh, first of all, how it is understood or what are the causes of migration understood? Then usually, as I said, they are understood from the economic point of view, poverty pushing people, uh, conflicts like in the case of Syria, as you mentioned, Helen, uh, or climate change in many parts of the world. For example, if you see the Sahel, Sahel region in, in Africa that uh, farmers are losing their, their fields because of, uh, of, of you know, climate change and water shortage and grazing land shortage, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. So this is one aspect from economic poli and political point of view. And the causes are usually seen as on the state level, poverty on the state level, political um, insecurity and conflict, and, and so on. But uh, there are, of course, causes also beyond the state level. That means what about conflicts between the states, displacing people, um, and moreover, they are global actors being involved in national conflicts, or if you take the Syrian case, which is the best example, it is not just the Syrian government, the main actor or the, or the rebels or um, the IS, the main actors there is, you have, you have Russia mainly, you have Turkey, you have um, you know, many actors. If you take Yemen, there are actors, if it's Saudi Arabia or, or if it is Iran, so we see that are conflicts which are not caused only by internal factors, but also by, by global actors. So um, that is may usually how migration causes are understood. So that is the first point. The second point is uh, how are the migration policies conceived? The policies at the destination or the policies on the, on the transit or in the transit countries. Now it becomes for me more psychological and more psychological in the sense that migration policy makers, the decision makers are usually those who have the power. Only those who have the power make decisions to, to keep out people. Migrants are usually not in a position to exert any power. Instead, they are just victims. They are displaced. They are searching for protection. Yeah? They are looking for protection. Yeah? So um, in Europe, as you have noticed from media and what you are observing, what we are observing here in Austria or in Europe, in Europe in general, is that the issue of identity is coming. Migrants are coming. They are going to replace our identity with Muslim identity, with um, identity of a new culture, a foreign culture, which is seen as a kind of threat, threat to the European, to the Christian, to the Western world, to the Western civilization, which is usually is this, the, depicted or which is uh, uh, presented as a kind of overall a general threat to the Western way of life. 
And here I see the kind of the issue of identification. So um, create an identity. Who are we, yeah. those who are in the West? And who are they, who are those coming? Now the issue of identity comes, who are we and who are they? And this here begins this kind of this othering. These are the others. These are the aliens. And these are the foreigners. And there is this kind of allocation of certain identity, given that identity, not, not as, as individual human beings, their identity is seen from the point of view as a threat, as a Muslim, as, as a foreigner, as a Syrian, but not as a human being primarily. And that is the issue of identity, which you raise, uh, dignity, sorry, the human dignity comes first, not my mus being a Muslim or a Christian or a Syrian, that is something secondary. So, but people are defined not first as human beings from the dignity point of view, but from the religious point of view, from the, from the state point of view, from to which nation do they belong? And that is where I see a problem, this kind of, these othering, these are aliens, these are different people who, who are going to be a problem for us. And then what we see is this bordering, first othering and then the border, we need a border. Mm -hmm. We have to secure our borders. We have, you know, we have to define and originally from the Latin term itself, definition comes from finis, from the border, from the end. And it is here, the foreigner starts and it is where I start and I begin. So we make this definition this border, because the definition and border have the same origin in the, in the link, from the linguistic point of view. And everything which is beyond this border can only be a threat because it does not belong to me. This bordering, it is something fascinating, interesting. If you take the, the southern, the wall in the, in the between Mexico and United States, or between Ceuta, Melilla, and, and, and Spain, uh, Spain in Morocco, it is not just a physical thing. It is a metaphorical thing. It is an idea. It is the separation of us and them. And, and the migrants know that as well. They know, they know that it is not separating them from the others physically, but also metaphorically. It is separating the identity, the belongingness. And this bordering is the meeting point of exclusion, this displacement. Wow. Wow. And that's why I like your term displacement in, the, in this panel. Displacement is there is a place, someone is putting someone in a certain place. Those who have the power place, those who are powerless, you belong here, you stay there and you are not allowed to move. And that is the placement that, and others are going to overcome this placement, overcome the, over the border, overcome the wall in, a, in, a, in order to gain this denied identity because identity is benign, being denied by someone. And, you know, uh, of course you Americans, you know better than I do, what uh, for me, one of the shocking um, happenings in the United States, uh, these white supremacist um, events, news uh, from the Christian American Association in 1945, who said, I, I quote it because it is telling, he said, they call me anti-Jew and anti-Nigger. Listen, we like the Nigger in his place, in mm -hmm. his place. And that is what tells me, so what is this place? Who shows me where my place is? And why someone defines where I belong to? Why can't I define where I belong to? And that is again, this power relation. Yes. This displacement is of course not just uh, because I am affected by war that I am moving, but also I don't want this place. I want another place because I would like to decide by myself where to be, uh, what to be, and you cannot define my identity. And, uh, and then I will stop with the last point so that we have enough uh, time for our discussion. My third point, based on my third question, is uh, 
migration is a process to go beyond this, this assignment of a place. And I, I, I see this as a negation or rejection or protest against the mode of power relations when I move, when I go out, when I go, uh, when I migrate, when I try to overcome this tower, this wall, I am rejecting this assignment of a, a place which some powerful people are doing. So migration, that's why I see it as a liberation process because I don't want to be here. Um, one last point in this context is my, my favorite scene is, you know, um, Rosa Louise Parks in 1955, when she was on the bus and she took a seat. And uh, since the bus was full, of course, you know the, all this story I tell you because it, it fits well here. Um, she was asked or she was obliged to, to, to leave the seat for a white person. And she said, no, I don't leave this, this seat. And that is exactly this rejection of placement. You cannot place me, you cannot put me where I sit. Instead, I decide by myself. So that is migration is a freedom. That's why I say migration as a liberation process. Yes. Migration as a freedom, migration as a displacement or the rejection of some placement put on me by someone else. So that is what I am trying to understand because I am trying to um, explore because so far migration research has become too much materialistic in the sense that if we address conflicts, if we address poverty, if we address climate change, people are not going to move. People are going to move because historically, slavery, uh, imperialism, colonization, supremacy, even Christian evangelization, which said African national, traditional religion is not worthy of being called religion. Therefore, we have to save them from themselves so that they can come into heaven. And all these kind of psychological, religious, political, historical pressure was on Africans. And we have to understand so this aspect of trying to move away from this assigned place historically and psychologically and to gain a new being and paradoxically by being with the former colonizer himself in order to imitate, in order to be one of the former colonizers. That's why I love uh, Franz Fanon, one of my favorite uh, writers who sees this kind of um, freedom as rejection of colonization, um, rejection of this internalization of the coloniality, and in order to become a new human being by, become, by becoming or by living together with, with the white person at the end. Uh, sorry for using the expression he used to say, the fact that the black man wants to sleep with a white woman is already telling a process of liberation because he has been always told that you are not a human being and you have to overcome this by imitating the white colonizer in order to become a real human being. So these are all things which I'm interested in in migration research. Sorry, I talked too much. Um, no. I'm looking forward to, to this. No, you did not. I, I thank you so very much for that expanded geopolitical look that gives further agency to these paintings. That can I? We, yes, please, Nora, please. No, I was gonna say, can I specifically pick you up on that word agency there? I, I would love to connect to what uh, Dr. Gabal said to um, part of what really has, I, I find so moving about uh, Jacob Lawrence's work and in the migration series in particular is that I think this is a series that explicitly grapples with a number of those questions that you're raising. Um, you know, Lawrence uh, had the opportunity, Lawrence is in Harlem, his, um, you know, he is in the middle of a very active art scene um, with artists who have um, taken a tremendous interest in educating um, children. So he begins his art classes as a young person with, with working artists um, who have taken full advantage of the New York art scene. And it is precisely this desire to create an artistic style and identity that is both unique and his own 
that reaches out hands to the Western art tradition that he has learned enormous numbers of things from, that reaches out to the sort of um, the grand Western tradition of um, seeking a kind of universal voice and a desire to speak to an audience um, that is not just uh, like himself, but also a refusal to disparage or look down upon the Southern folk traditions um, that the migrants brought with them to uh, Harlem and to the North. You know, his, um, and I spent a lot of time in my, in my work trying to sort of piece together some of the origins of his style, which is, you know, you, very unique. Um, you can recognize the Lawrence painting instantly, right? There is, um, and I really trying to identify sort of where did he develop this style from? And part of what was fascinating about it is that you can find echoes in exhibits of African work that he saw uh, in New York yes. um, in this period. So there is a kind of applique uh, tradition out of the uh, Dahomey people that was exhibited in New York that has some visual references. Um, there's, I think, some fascinating connections to um, quilt making and the use of solid um, blocks uh, and to create shapes and forms. Um, but at the same time, the flatness, the um, the distortions of space, the abstraction that we were talking about earlier are all deeply tied to his familiarity with uh, 20th century modernism in the very European tradition. And so a part of what I find so powerful about Lawrence is exactly this refusal to allow himself to be categorized, um, and, but also his assertion that he has the right to own and use whatever he wants of the European tradition. And I think that that to me is a, um, is a particular and interesting and powerful part of his work um, that may, that, you know, was not necessarily um, embraced then uh, in some of the sort of uh, 60s, 70s black power sort of movements. There is some pushback on Lawrence as sort of perhaps too tied to the European tradition. Um, and while certainly recognizing the value and validity of that criticism, I think that it is helpful to understand his work in this context of migration um, precisely in those terms of um, wanting to assert his ability to own the tradition that his family um, literally migrated into, um, both forcibly and, and voluntarily, um, and that, the, that Harlem in some ways represents perhaps um, a very particularly fascinating um, sort of historical moment of where um, he spent a lot of time at a place called the Schomburg Library in Harlem, which was uh, a repository of, uh, of scholarship about African uh, descended people, African diasporic people from all over the world. And I think gave him a sense of having a history of pride, but also in a history that was sort of, um, uh, a history that he could draw from without feeling as if he was coming to European history at a disadvantage, um, coming at, at sort of as an equal and asserting his ability to create there. So, you know, to bring that back then to Helen's work, part of what I find really moving about Helen's work is then her sense that she can use Lawrence's um, visual tradition in a way to help her understand and grapple with her own migration experience and the migration experience of the Syrian uh, migrants or Syrian refugees, um, that those visual forms, again, to your point, um, that we can be enriched and uh, um, empowered by our, our collision with the other, as well as being sort of frightened of it. Yeah, can I just um, latch right on to what you're both saying? I think all of us, it's this idea, you use the word agency, um, it's storytelling. And what you're basically saying is Jacob Lawrence, he was empowering and empowered to tell his own story and the stories that he related to of his mother, of his relatives, of the stories that he heard when he was a little boy about the migration. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And, and, uh, and also, you know, the, um, uh, the, to the previous uh, discussion, it's, it's this um, empowering of telling our own story. And, and I think that's what he's doing here in his series, as I'm trying to do. Uh, I'm, you know, so I, I agree with you 100%, and you both said it much more eloquently than I did. I try and visualize it, but um, yeah, it's um, that vindication that your story is as powerful as your oppressors or where you're leaving. 
you know. I agree. I, yeah. I think at this juncture, given this wonderful discussion that we're having, which is so very rich. And uh, again, Dr. Gabriel has offered for us an, an expanded, uh, more critical look at the geopolitics of movement and freedom and your repeated use of the critical words, human dignity. And this is, uh, again, something that attracted me to your scholarship um, and how we began this conversation, this ongoing perpetual absence of humanity and freedom and to be able to choose, as is often said in South Africa, Ubuntu, that the human being must be recognized um, first. And certainly, Nora, you're bringing in yet again how we, are, we can draw these connections from the political, the geopolitical, and see how these images do indeed represent something much bigger, that when we look at them more closely, there are stories. Jacob Lawrence was indeed a great storyteller, which brings me back to you, Helen. Oh. All of this began with you, Helen. <gasps> yes, it did. I was <laughs> so very happy. You may recall over a year ago, I sent you an email on your website. And yes. I said, what are the odds of her responding? She's a very busy artist. I had read your bio that you had just completed an exhibition, I think at the United Nations and that you were speaking, you were, I said, what are the odds that this busy artist whose work um, represents specifically your Syrian migration series is one that was inspired by, again, Jacob Lawrence. So much to my delight, hmm. Helen responded. She responded not only to my inquiry that we were planning this exhibit, and you would also share that you had an opportunity to meet Jacob Lawrence, yes. that you have a letter. Yes. yes, I think we are now at a point where we can bring an even greater personal narrative to this conversation. Helen, can you please share with us the letter? I would be honored, I would be honored. And I know Jacob Lawrence, he's up there. He's gonna listen to me. Yeah. Uh, Okay, thank you so much. This is so exciting. So yes, I got to meet Jacob Lawrence. I stood in line um, at the Phillips Collection when he was here in Washington, D.C. Um, for a retrospective of his work. And um, I, I will just tell you about that meeting quickly in a love letter I wrote to him. <laughs> uh, Dear, I hope he's listening. Dear Jacob Lawrence, I met you once back in 1993 when you had your migration series on exhibit at the Phillips Collection here in Washington. Do you remember me? I brought my father to meet you too. He was born in Damascus, Syria. As we waited in line to shake your hand, the line was so long. Do you remember? I tried hard to think of something brilliant to say to you. As the line inched closer, finally there I was, standing in front of you. As you sat on that red velvet couch, smiling up at me, you took my hand and I began to cry, not saying a word. My brief shiny moment to tell you how much your work, your style, your soul, and your spirit have inspired me since the first time I saw your paintings when I came to America. My chance to tell you I love you was gone. As I blinked to where, as I blinked away tears, I swore at least I would never wash my hand again. Who would have thought that 26 years later, I would be sitting on this stage at the Phillips Collection talking about my own work. And now here I am, an Arab American, born in Lebanon, sharing my own migration story and telling the stories of 13 million Syrians, migrants, refugees, fleeing war, poverty, drought, bombs, and starvation. Mm -hmm. I too have painted their stories and tried to give voice to these voice, these people fleeing injustice and violence, just as you did in your paintings. You allowed them to speak, to share their experiences, to show their dignity their beauty, perseverance, and even hope. I have tried to do the same. 
but you must be tired of listening to me and maybe a little bit sad because it seems that history repeats itself. But I have been listening to you all along. Your paintings and your stories have endured and speak to us louder now, maybe more than ever. I hope others will listen too. I'll sign off now and let you get back to being in heaven. Much love, Helen. P.S. I did finally end up washing my hand. P.S.S. And I can finally tell you, I love you. And I love you. I love you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Helen. I feel like crying now, you guys. I feel like. <sighs> oh, you told me about this letter. And after hearing it, this is the first time I'm hearing it. I had no idea that it would have the depth that it does. Dina, you're in the audience. We should have this letter in the exhibit. <laughs> I'm happy to. <laughs> we should include this letter in the yeah. exhibit. It serves as a testament, as a proclamation, as a continuing legacy, not only to Lawrence's work, but certainly your love for his work and which inspired you so greatly. What a beautiful letter. Thank, Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. I think what we can do now is perhaps take a few questions from our audience. Let's see um, if there are any questions. Let me just take a look here. Um, some members of our audience are saying, what a beautiful letter. What a gorgeous letter. Great letter, Helen. Thank you, thank you. Oh, I love this comment. The serendipitous, not really coincidental joy of email introductions. Hooray for Doris and <laughs> Helen and their emails. <laughs> I'm sure Dr. Gabriel, Helen, and Nora, now you know more about me. I write emails. And much to my delight, we are, I was just reading a fascinating article in the New Yorker that um, given this isolation that we're experiencing, that it appears that we are more inundated by the digital and by emails and how swamped we are by the mountains of these, of these types of communications. So as you can imagine, I cannot begin to thank each of you enough for responding to my email. I'm sure out of the hundreds, if not thousands, that you would receive, that it did not even go to spam even, that it actually found its way into your mailbox. So I'm truly grateful. Let's see, we have a couple of additional comments here. Thanks for a wonderful conversation. A reminder to all of you, all of you to let people know we care about them before it's too late. Thank you, Doris. Do we have any questions? Are there any questions for our panelists before we close? I want to keep you here. It's amazing how quickly the hour, I mean, I know. the hour has zipped by. I know. Well, I think you have said it all. Again, Helen, your letters serve to truly bring a beautiful closure to what I think has been a fruitful, in-depth, rich conversation. Dr. Bellatru de Brown, thank you so very much for contributing your scholarship, your recent scholarship, and for, by, for providing yet another perspective that breathes life into these beautiful images. And as I shared with Helen, these the, the tragic beauty of these images. You offer yet another form of critical agency that gives them meaning. Nora Nazelski Eichner. Again, I cannot begin to thank you enough for responding to my email and that I would encounter your wonderful scholarship that I would find myself, I awaken very early here. Um, I've lived here in Egypt for 16 years and I'm now living here in New Cairo where our new campus is. And I'm often awakened every night by the chorus of dogs. Cairo has a large population of wild dogs and at night they gather in their packs. 
and they literally begin barking where it's a, it becomes a symphony, literally a symphony arises. So it's part of my awakening, literally my awakening. So I find myself up early with my cup of tea and it's during those moments, Nora, when I encountered your work and that I became enamored with your scholarship. So I am grateful to you that you would also respond to my email. And I'm Helen, my beautiful Helen, I, I will share that as we know, phonetically in the English language, we only use three glottal sounds. Whereas in Arabic, I do believe there's perhaps five or six, maybe even more. So what I often found myself sharing with Helen, and she, she will smile, I see she's already smiling, that yeah. my pronunciation of her name, that I would often offer an apology that I make a critical attempt to pronounce it. And when you sent to me a few days ago, that often in the American pronunciation, that it has taken on somewhat of an acceptance. And I think again, phonetically and linguistically, because of the absence of the not of our not using the number of glottals that is certainly found in Arabic, I must say that I love your name. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, for me, I, I am so grateful and so honored to be here with both of you incredible panelists. I was taking notes when you were speaking and, and Doris and, and Thank you for writing that email and, and Dina for the incredible opportunity to be alongside, as you know, my hero and, and echoed with my letter, my love letter to him. Um, this has to be one of the highlights of my, my career. I really, oh. I, yes, I really see it that way. I'm not exaggerating. Um, and I am grateful, grateful to share my work uh, with your audience and, um, I think all of us hope that as some one of your commenters made, you didn't forget us. You didn't forget. This is yes. the point. We're, we're doing this. We're writing. We're speaking about this to not forget. And the idea of that is so we don't repeat the same mistakes. But, you know, this is this is, you know, some of the, the questions that you were uh, talking about, Professor. Um, so anyways, I'm grateful beyond and. Um, and thank you so much. What a big honor. Oh, Helen, you have no idea what an honor it is to have you with us. Thank that you. your work can stand alongside your hero as you refer <laughs> to Lawrence. So yeah. This is truly yeah. beautiful. We thank are so grateful to each and every one of you. I know that for Nora and Helen, your day is just beginning. It is for Dr. Gabriel and I, the end of a busy day. I, I cannot, again, begin to express my gratitude, my appreciation, my profound sense of happiness that we were able to join together in this virtual space and to talk from an interdisciplinary manner, how very important art is, how it can articulate the human condition. And that certainly Jacob Lawrence was indeed among one of the greatest storytellers. And Helen, you are certainly continuing with that tradition. So Nora Mazitsky Eichner, Dr. Belachu Gabriel, and Helen Dukweb. As you see, I tried. <laughs> it's perfect. I want to thank you all. Let's do this again. Let's, Let's do, do it again. again. I noticed that one of the comments, I want to read it before we go. I want to capture it so I can write it down. And it looks like, okay, here we are. One of our, uh, one of the comments from the audience, Doris, you should see the movie Strays about the wild dogs of Istanbul. Your story about the barking reminded me it's a fun and short film. And there are Syrian refugees in the film. Thank you oh. for that. Yes, strays. I've made a note of it, and I'm sure that perhaps I can even share it with my students. I've often even thought of writing a short story myself that I've grown so accustomed now to listening to the dogs that 
at a particular hour here in New Cairo, they gather and they literally awaken the neighborhood with this chorus. They all commence to sing in unison together <laughs> as if they're telling the world, we're here too. We share this city. Wake up. We, <laughs> as Dr. Gabriel was saying, we want the freedom to move about as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you all so Thank very you. much. Yeah. Nora, Helen, Dr. Gabriel, have a lovely evening. Let's please stay in touch. Absolutely. I am going to share this video with you. Um, I will be certainly communicating with you by email as a follow-up, but again, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Take good Bye. care. Bye. 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 Helen, Helen, oh yes. my, yes, hello. Hi. <laughs> that, oh, I, as you can see, I'm having difficulty saying goodbye to you. I hate the, I hate the part of saying goodbye. I just want to jump in there and hug you. And the, they were, it was fantastic.